Hello everybody. In this video, we're going to talk about image formation, uh, specifically by a plane mirror. I'll also talk a little bit about curved mirrors, but you are only responsible for knowing about plane mirrors. Uh, curved mirrors are neat to talk about, and if we do get together in person, I'll, I'll show you some demos with curved mirrors. So to get started, I'm going to uh, open up a PowerPoint in just a second and go through that. I want to show you, though, you can grab this PowerPoint if you go to our course page and scroll down. Uh, you can see it right here. There's a list of things here that uh, we'll use. Some we may not, but um, we'll use a lot of these things. And a lot of these are PowerPoint presentations that you can look at on your own time also. So I'm going to open up this one, the mirrors one. I have it open already and uh, let's go through this. So before we get to talking specifically about mirrors, I want to talk about image formation in general. And I've drawn this as a flow chart. Uh, this is the first time we've talked about image formation. So I think it's appropriate just to talk um, and, and introduce some terms for any general image formation, not just by mirrors. So we're going to start with an object and light is either going to bounce off of this object, which if that's the case, we call that a reflection object. And most objects when they're imaged are reflection objects, but you could have light going through the object. So we call that a transmission object. If you think of uh, an old time carousel slide projector, if you've ever seen those where the individual slides, um, the light goes through those slides uh, to a projecting lens and then project it onto a screen. Or if you think about the projectors in a classroom, uh, the current projectors that we have, light goes through a, a uh, LCD screen. Okay. But in any case, light is going to come from the object. From there, we direct the light into what we call an optical system. Inside the optical system, we have optical elements. Now, our optical systems are going to be pretty simple that we look at. You can have many optical elements in a system. So what's an optical element? This is any device that redirects or changes the path of the light rays. So conventional optical elements are things like lenses, mirrors, prisms, but you could have something like a diffraction grating in your optical system also. So anything that changes the path of the light. Okay, then once the light leaves the optical system, then the light uh, can form an image. Now, three things can happen to the rays that leave the optical system. They can converge. So as the rays leave the optical system, they can be getting closer together. If that's the case, when they intersect, where they intersect, you will form what's called a real image. It is possible, though, that the light rays will diverge as they leave the optical system. They'll get farther apart. In that case, the optical system forms what we call a virtual image. The third thing that I don't have written here because you wouldn't usually do this. You could have the rays exiting the optical system where they neither con converge or diverge. So they would be parallel. We call that a collimated beam. Actually, there is a device called a collimator where you would want that to happen. So I shouldn't say where you would not want this to happen. Um, but so if you want to get a nice collimated beam, you can use an optical system called a collimator. But that's a special case, and we're not going to look at that. Now, the real image and the virtual image formation, you'll see how this works as we get through more and more examples. I will say, though, that a plain mirror can only form a virtual image. I'll say that now, and we'll see why that is and what exactly we mean by that. Okay, so this photo, or I should say this picture, I found in a textbook. And this just shows you the general idea of how the virtual image is formed by a mirror. Um, we'll do uh, what I call an official ray trace on the next slide. But you can see right here, this is the object, this blue point. So just imagine there's some light hitting this and bouncing off of it. In this picture, they've drawn three 
different paths for the light, three different rays. So let's look at this bottom ray. It comes down like this and hits this mirror. Now, this optical system consists of one reflecting surface that's planar. So you're going to use the law of reflection to figure out what happens to that ray. Well, by the law of reflection, that ray is going to reflect so that the angle of incidence equals the uh, angle of reflection. So if I were to draw a surface normal, that would be a horizontal line just like that, the angle of incidence would equal the angle of reflection. And you do that for the other two rays. Okay. Now, if you look at those reflected rays, they have left the optical system now. Right? It's a simple optical system, one reflecting surface. So you ask yourself, are they diverging or converging? Are they getting farther apart, diverging, or are they getting closer together, converging? Well, you see that they're diverging. Okay, so we know we're going to get a virtual image. So how does that work? Where is this virtual image? Okay, so whenever you have diverging rays coming from your optical system, what you do is you trace them backwards. That's what these dashed lines are. Trace them straight backwards, and they should appear to come from that intersection point. That is where the image point is going to be formed. So this object point, this blue point, is going to be imaged over here. We call this a virtual image because the only way you see it is if you actually have some of these diverging rays entering your eye or a camera, for instance. If I were to put a piece of paper here behind this mirror, I wouldn't see anything on that piece of paper. It's not a real image. So a real image, and we'll have to wait until we get to lenses to see real image formation, but a real image, you put a piece of paper there where the rays converge and you will see the image on that piece of paper, okay? Um, so again, to see the real image, some system usually a person's eye or a camera, has to catch some of those diverging rays. Your brain or the camera right, will see the image as if it is over here behind the mirror. Okay, Now, I put always right here because you will always get this virtual image from a plain mirror. That's all it can do. Okay, Now, the P and the Q, we call this the object distance and the image distance. Um, I'll, I'll explain that in more detail on the next slide, but I just wanted to show you that picture. Now let's do the official ray trace, and we're, you're going to have to learn um, how to do these ray traces, uh, because I, I may ask you to do ray traces on a test, for instance. Okay, so the first thing you do is we normally draw the light going from left to right, and we put our optical elements on a horizontal axis. So we draw a horizontal line, we'll call that the optic axis. Then we put our optical element uh, centered on the optical axis, or the optic axis, excuse me. So there, that line represents my single reflecting surface, my plane mirror. Then we need a generic object. So we, we like to use arrows for our objects and images. So I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to put an uh, upright arrow somewhere to the left. When we do these, we always start on the left and have the light going to the right. Okay, so there is my object. Now, in order to figure out where the image is formed, you have to draw a minimum of two rays. In that last picture, there were three rays drawn, but we can get away with two rays. And it doesn't matter what the optical system looks like. So we'll always draw these two rays. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw them from the tip of the object arrow. All right, so the first ray that we're always going to draw is going to be parallel to the optic axis from the tip of the object arrow to the optical element. Now, then you say, okay, well, what happens to that ray? This is a reflecting surface. So by the law of reflection, that ray should go right back to the left. The angle of incidence is zero. You can imagine if I were to draw a surface normal, it would be horizontal. So theta one is zero, theta R, reflected angle is zero, so the ray reflects right back to the left, and I have it going past the object. All right, so we've done that ray. Now, the second ray that we always will draw is from the same point on the object 
to the intersection point of the optical element with the optic axis. We'll always draw this ray, no matter what this optical element is. So we've drawn the ray. Now we use the law of reflection to figure out where that ray goes. Well, the optic axis is acting as our surface normal. So here's the angle of incidence right there. So the angle of reflection is going to equal that. So that purple ray is going to reflect that way. Now, I've finished my two rays. They're leaving the optical system. So then you ask yourself, are these two rays converging or diverging as they leave the optical system? This one's going to the left horizontally. This purple one's going down to the left. They're getting farther apart. They're diverging. So what do we do? We know we're going to get a virtual image. Trace the exiting rays backwards. So if I trace the purple one backwards with that dashed line, it's going like this. That orange one that was going to the left, that ray, it's going to be traced backwards here. I do it until they intersect. I know that that is the tip now of the image arrow. And I know the, the uh, um, other end of the image arrow is going to be on the optic axis. So once I know where the tip is, I can quickly just fill it in. There is my image right there. Okay, so we did it. Now, if you notice, I, I only did the upper part, right? I didn't consider what, was, what, what would be happening if I had a lower part to my object. It's not necessary to do that because we're going to assume we have symmetrical optical systems. So whatever happens to the uh, vertical up, uh, the, the, let's call it the positive part, if you will, of the object, right? That's going to be happening also to the negative part. So whatever imaging we get to this top arrow would be the same as the bottom arrow. It would be the same for an arrow coming out of the screen, right? So we only have to do this one dimension. Okay, now let's start labeling things and introducing some quantities. So the first thing that we're going to introduce is something called the object distance. And we're going to signify that with a P. Another conventional symbol for this is S, but I'm going to use P. Okay, now, because we're going to get some formulas involved, we want the ability of describing to the right or to the left. So we're going to use this sign convention over here. To the right horizontally is plus, to the left negative, up vertically is positive, down vertically is negative. Okay, because we're going to use formulas here, we have definite ways to measure these quantities. The object distance, you can see this direction of measure, is always measured from object to the optical element, always. So in this case, that would be a positive value for the object distance. Okay, the next quantity we're going to introduce is Q, called the image distance. Um, if you use S for object distance, uh, you use S prime for image distance. Those are common, but I'm going to just use P and Q. Now, there's a definite way to measure that. It's from the optical element to the image, always, always from left, uh, well, I should say from the element to the image, because the image may not always be formed on the right side of the optical element. For a mirror, it always is a plain mirror, but we'll see when we get to um, uh, the next uh, video. And with lenses, that's not always the case. So in this case, that would be a positive object, uh, excuse me, image distance. Okay, and then we have the object height. That's measured from the axis to the tip of the object. We call that H. That would be a positive object height. And then we have the image height, uh, the height from the axis to the tip of the image. For this mirror, the plane mirror, you're always going to get a positive image height if the object height is positive. Okay, so there's how to do the official ray trace. Okay, now, Again, in order to see this virtual image, your eye has to catch these diverging rays. So here's your eye over here, right? And your brain's going to see the image right there. If you think about a plain mirror, you guys look in a plain mirror often, right? Um, when you're getting ready in the morning. If you think about, right, if you had to reach out and touch that image, where would you be reaching? You'd be you'd be trying to reach behind, right? Put your hand through the mirror and go behind it. Uh, that's because you're seeing that virtual image right there behind the mirror, okay? All right, 
Now you might ask, hey, it looks on this beautifully drawn diagram, thank you, that P might equal Q and H looks like it equals H prime. You would be correct. In fact, let's, let's just summarize that right here. Here's a picture from a book just showing the ray trace that I did. Um, and in fact, for the mirror, a plane mirror, P does equal Q, H does equal H prime. So we're going to get a virtual image always, and we're going to say it is non-inverted. What I mean by that is the image is not flipped with respect to the object direction. Right? So if the object's pointing up, the image arrow will point up. So we call that non-inverted. In some optical systems, you can get an inverted image, but not for a plane mirror. And this now is a good time to introduce a quantity called the lateral magnification. We'll use this quantity not just for mirrors, but also for lenses. And the lateral magnification is defined to be the ratio of the image height to the object height. That's it, H prime over H. Now, if you think about it then, if the magnification is positive, that just means that the image is non-inverted with respect to the object. It doesn't mean just because it's positive that the image is bigger than the object. A lot of people think get that confused, okay? Similarly, a negative lateral magnification just means that the image is inverted with respect to the object. It does just looking at the sign of the magnification doesn't tell you anything about the relative sizes. Okay, in fact, what you can do then is look at the absolute value, right? If the absolute value of the magnification is bigger than 1, then the absolute value of H prime is definitely bigger than the absolute value of H, and this image is going to be bigger if you look at the lateral dimension. If the absolute value of M is less than 1, then the image is smaller, okay? The plane mirror is always going to give you a lateral magnification of plus 1, always. Uh, we would call that a 1x magnification in optics lingo. Okay, now speaking of these ray traces, here's the one we just did. Uh, you guys can practice these. I want you to imagine what would happen if we moved the object, it's right here, if we moved it farther to the left. Okay, can you imagine what would happen, what those rays would look like? Oh, it would look like this. Okay. And again, you can verify that by drawing the rays yourself. So what I'm showing is that as you walk the object back to the left, right, the image is going to be walking back from the mirror to the right. P will always equal Q, always equal Q, and H will always equal H prime. If we move the object closer together, again, you can confirm this if you want on your own ray trace, the image will get closer, be formed closer to the mirror, okay? All right. Oh, here's a nice application of that. Um, you guys, uh, in your car, you may know that your rear view mirror mounted on your windshield, there's, there are two settings, a daytime setting and a nighttime setting. Um, so if you're driving at night and somebody's behind you in a car and you have the daytime setting of the mirror, when you look in the mirror, you'll see a lot of light coming from the, the headlights of the car. It makes you squint. So somebody had this great idea. Watch this. The piece of glass that's put uh, on that mirror, and the piece of glass is just for protection. There's not much reflection from the piece of glass, okay, normally on a plane mirror. It's this metalized layer that does the majority of the reflecting. So a lot of times people say, oh, you don't even have to worry about the reflection from the mirror, right? Like the mirror in your bathroom, yeah, you don't worry about that because the vast majority of the light's being reflected from that metalized surface. But there's a little bit of light being reflected from the glass surface. And we actually take advantage of that in the design of the car's rear view mirror for the nighttime setting. Because what somebody discovered was, let's make this piece of glass trapezoidal in shape like this. You guys see it? Now, here's what happens. Um, let's suppose that we look at this ray coming in right here, this one coming in straight horizontal. See it? Okay, so think of this. This is light coming in through the rear window of the car over your shoulder. Okay, so if you trace that ray, you will see that 
a tiny bit of the light's going to reflect off the glass interface and go along direction D. Okay? The majority of the light's going to go into the glass. It's going to refract up a little bit, hit the reflecting surface. Almost all of that's going to reflect, and then it's going to refract back out away from the surface normal up to your eye along path B. Okay? So a lot of that light that's coming over your shoulder right, is going to end up in your eye, and you can see the car behind you and everything else. The problem is, if you had this tilted like this at night, there's not a, light, not a lot of light coming in from the surroundings. There's a lot of light coming right over your shoulder from that car's headlights directly behind you. So when you look in the mirror, you'd have a lot of that car headlight energy going right into your eye when you look in the mirror. So somebody said, look, all you got to do now is tilt this mirror up. So you put your finger on that little tab and tilt it up. And lo and behold, let's trace that horizontal ray. Look, now this is the car headlight energy, right? It's coming in. You get a little bit of reflection from the glass surface and it enters your eye. But that's enough for you to see that there are headlights behind you. The vast majority of that headlight light is going to refract through the glass, reflect off the back metalized surface, and then refract away from the surface normal and go up and hit the ceiling of your car. All right, so that's really an ingenious idea, and it's a really simple solution to that problem. Okay, I'm hitting the 21 minute mark, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right here, and I'll do another video where we looked at the curved mirrors. Okay, because I think that, yeah, that's our next topic, so I'm going to stop here. Okay, I don't want to make these videos too long. Okay, bye-bye.